Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's Meet the Regulator event. You can probably see I'm not going to stand behind the podium. Hopefully, you can still see me. I know the room is quite busy, which is great to see, but if you need to shuffle around to be able to see and hear and see the screen, feel free to be able to do that. Um, also, just to say at the start, the event is being filmed, so if you'd rather you weren't in that film, if you speak to Ian, who's over in the corner here, you can make sure that happens. So, the first thing I wanted to do was to say welcome. This is obviously the Meet the Charity Regulator event. It's really important for us to get out to meet you and remind ourselves about the diversity and impact that you all have across Scotland. The next thing I wanted to do was introduce myself and talk a little bit about hats and all the hats that we wear. Um, my name's Pat Armstrong. I am currently vice chair at Oscar. I've been on the board of Oscar since 2014. Um, my day job is also as chief exec of ACOSFO, which is the Association of Chief Officers of Scottish Voluntary Organisations. So I have the privilege of being able to work between working with the chief execs and the exec team in charities and working with the boards and the governance. So I feel very privileged to be able to do that. With another hat, I chair Scotland's Third Sector Governance Forum, who lead on Trustee Week in Scotland. And I can't help but do a quick little plug. Anyone that's interested in coming along, we have an event that's been growing year on year all through the week of 12th of November. So it'll be launched on 12th of November with a conference in Glasgow. And it's called The Hero's Journey um, to highlight the amazing work that's done by trustees across the country. Um, finally, I'm a board member myself. I sit on the board of Euclid, which is a European network to empower civil society and social enterprise. So I just wanted to flag that up because I think everybody in this room will wear a huge number of hats and there's a huge diversity and a huge range of knowledge and experience in this room already. Um, and I wanted to also say that these events are really important not only for us, for you to hear from us, we want to hear from you, but I think also as a board member or a charity trustee, you quite often only know the board that you're involved in. So this is also an opportunity for you all to speak to each other and to share support and good practice and learning and maybe get a different perspective on the role. So we hope you get an opportunity to do all of those things. So I've got two more parts to my role. First is housekeeping. We're not expecting a fire alarm. If the alarm does go off, there's double doors over here, which is the quickest way out when we meet in front of the building. Um, toilets, gents are on this floor, ladies are um, downstairs and straight ahead and there's an accessible toilet also through the double doors. Um, mobiles, if you could just keep them on silent, we'd be delighted if you would like to tweet. The hashtag is MTCR, as in Meet the Charity Regulator, 2018. Um, so feel free if you would like to do that. Um, the next thing for me to do is to very briefly run through what's going to be happening. Um, so David is going to speak to us about the purpose of the event <coughs> and a bit about Oscar. Um, then we will get some information from Jude on safeguarding. Then we will have a break. Um, we also have various different stands and Oscar staff that you'll be able to speak to and visit. Um, after the break, Laura is going to run through the role of the trustee. After each presentation, there'll be time to have a chat, to ask some questions and to work a bit more interactively. So hopefully we'll get um, a chance to hear from you as well as you to hear from us. Um, so that leaves my role to try and keep us to time, to try and keep the afternoon running. Um, but my next step is to pass to David Robb, Chief Exec of Oscar. David. Um, good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here. Um, a warm welcome to you all. This is a huge crowd, not, not quite a record. Our Edinburgh and Glasgow meetings always draw a big crowd, but um, I was just scanning the lists, and thank you to those who've travelled, particularly 
long way to get here. Uh, it's always great. And, and we always enjoy these meetings. It's a real uh, chance for us both to get out and demystify things about the Scottish Charity Regulator. A any of you been to our offices in Dundee? Yes, yes a handful, handful. Oh, Anne, hello. <laughs> Anne's travelled quite a long way, so she's come down from Shetland. Um, but uh, the, the usual thing is that not many folk come to visit us in Dundee, uh, so part of the function of today is to give you a sense of uh, what goes on there, to demystify things about the, the weird and wonderful world of, of charity regulation. But also, as Pat has said, this is a great opportunity for us to take the temperature uh, in the charity sector, get a sense of the issues that are bothering you, uh, and we really do use your input and your feedback uh, to focus our, our work programme. So I've got about half an hour, not many slides. Um, all the slides should be available to you um, if you've not seen them already, certainly after today. So don't, don't worry too much about taking notes. Uh, all the information will be available. So this is really what I want to focus on, to introduce ourselves, uh, to give you some uh, topical information, and as I say, to give you a chance to ask us questions uh, or to comment on some of the, the things that you're hearing about. So here we are, there's Shetland. Uh, we are now legally obliged to have Shetland on the map, so there, there it is. So set up in uh, 2006, I think, so more than 12 years old now, Oscar uh, is the uh, charity registra registrar and regulator for over 24,400 charities in Scotland. So we have no minimum size. Uh, everything that is recognised as a charity in Scotland is on the register, um, and charity law therefore applies uh, equally across the board. But as you could imagine, 24,400 uh, is quite a broad uh, spectrum, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we try and uh, operate proportionally um, across that uh, tremendous breadth. So the vision of, of what we're about, um, ultimately it's our job to underpin public trust and confidence and that's where we think we're adding value. The Scottish charity sector was very keen um, as the legislation um, that was passed through the Scottish Parliament based on Jean McFadden's uh, report, the McFadden Commission. But the, the charity sector was keen to have a regulator so it wasn't imposed uh, uh, sector recognised that being independently regulated uh, was a good way of signalling uh, to the public on whose um, trust you depend as charities uh, that uh, <coughs> things were being run properly. So that's our job, is to try and support an environment where the public can have trust and confidence in charities um, and that's what our activities are focused on. And we've identified four main strands of, of what we do. So helping the public have more confidence, helping charity trustees to understand and comply with your legal duties. We think it's only fair that if we're going to hold you to account, we give you some sense of what you're expected to do. So education and events like this is a key part of our job. Um, we want to ensure that registration and reporting is straightforward and proportionate. We, we try and not burden you with red tape. Um, our annual return is, we hope, fairly simple and straightforward. <coughs> Sometimes new charities take a wee bit of a while to get into the swing of it. But uh, as we go out and uh, get feedback on our activities, we're really pleased now that uh, charities accept that the annual return is just part and parcel of what they do uh, and in general, the view is that it's not too burdensome. But we've always got to work hard to strike that balance for very small charities. An awful lot of charities in Scotland have no paid staff. It's entirely volunteer input. And what's appropriate for a charity like that <coughs> might be different for a charity that has 250 staff and offices all around Scotland. And the last um, part of our strategic plan is just uh, making sure that we're focused on improvement and efficiency. We are uh, wholly publicly funded. You might want to ask me about that later, but at the moment, all the money comes straight 
uh, from the Scottish Parliament and we're required to uh, make the best use of that that we can. So what do we do? What kind of things go on in our office in Dundee? We've got about 50 staff. Um, the largest group is in our registration team uh, on working on applications. We get maybe 1,200 applications a year from people who think they would like to be a charity. Um, some people withdraw uh, in the course of that conversation. We refuse a handful uh, every year. There's not that many we actually refuse. But there's uh, around a thousand new charities coming onto the register every year. Uh, once you are registered as a charity, there's certain changes you might want to make for which the regulator's consent is required. So we've got quite a busy uh, group of staff working on consents or reorganisations. We then have an engagement team and Jude Turbine, you'll hear from Jude later, Jude heads the engagement team. So that is uh, practising what we call a kind of preventative form of regulation. We want to, uh, as I say, uh, support trustees so that they can understand what's expected of them. We'll try and um, give practical advice and guidance on issues that might be of concern to the sector. Uh, so we're trying to get upstream of problems. Uh, it is our job and through the monitoring and enforcement arm that we have, we do have to get involved where there's uh, allegations of misconduct in charities, but we would far rather uh, pre prevent those problems from happening in the first place. So we think we can add most value by getting upstream of the problem and helping raise standards of governance uh, in the sector. But we do have uh, an enforcement and monitoring role uh, and we do get a steady stream of complaints about charities, concerns that are raised with us, and we have to investigate and take action uh, where we've found serious uh, misconduct. We practice what we're calling uh, targeted regulation. Um, over the years that we've been operating, we realise that there's all sorts of non-compliance. Some of it is fairly innocent and technical and inadvertent. What we really want to focus our energy on is the big, serious, willful abuse of charitable status or the mismanagement um, of charitable assets. So we've identified six priorities and that's uh, helping us focus our um, efforts and our activities. So deliberate mismanagement of charities, uh, that would be our top concern. Criminal activity, um, and often we act as a referral agency there. Um, the, the police and the courts will deal with any uh, criminal activity, but sometimes the misconduct uh, kind of just falls below that threshold, so we will look at that. And obviously over the last few months there's been a focus on safeguarding and sexual misconduct, uh, and that's why we've got a session uh, later to talk a bit more about that. Charity trustee lack of knowledge. Uh, as I say, we think it's only fair to give you a sporting chance, let you know what the rules are before we pull you up for, um, for breaching them. So we do think that's uh, a risk um, to trust and confidence if trustees don't fully understand what's expected of them. Some uh, people sadly will uh, seek to abuse charitable status and they will operate uh, charities for private benefit. Um, that's something we have to police very heavily. Lack of clarity of the charity brand, so bodies at the margins of charitable status. Um, there's, always, there's always a process when we get a new member of staff in Dundee uh, and there's a process where they'll look at the, the register and they'll say, oh, I had no idea that was a charity. Um, and the breadth and the variety of things that are on the register is a continual surprise to people. Um, now that's a strength, but it's also a possible risk. If the public can't have confidence that they understand what should be a charity, if there are things included in our register that make them kind of furrow their brow and say, I'm not sure that should be a charity, then there's a potential risk there. So uh, part of our job is just to make sure that people's perception of what is a legitimate charity these days is fully up to date and modern because any idea that um, people have that the charity sector is old fashioned or 
pedestrian or you know not very current that's the opposite of my impression in the years I've been working with Oscar the charity sector is vibrant dynamic it responds very quickly uh, that's one of its real strengths is that it's agile and able to <coughs> spot a problem design a solution have it in place before parts of the public sector have got out of bed it, it seems to me so charity sector very dynamic very responsive but around that agility uh, there's just a job to make sure that public perception keeps up um, with the ever-changing world of, of charities. So we're, we're just trying to make sure that people have a proper, accurate, modern understanding of, of what modern charities are all about. And charities that don't provide public benefit. There's a, there's a lot of legal uh, specificity about the public benefit test. Uh, we have good legislation uh, provided to us by the Scottish Parliament. It's quite clear about what you need to do in order to demonstrate public benefit. Sometimes um, that's a, a fine balance um, and that's something we look at carefully when charities apply for status and also as we monitor their activities. So those are our top six areas of concern. Uh, that's what we try and focus our energy on. There are other kinds of non-compliance it won't be as high priority as that and we're trying to make sure that we're a bit more relaxed um, and we deal with that um, in a fairly cursory way that's the stuff we'll try and uh, put the real effort into so that gives you a sense of what goes on in Dundee and we're lucky to have a very knowledgeable and talented team some of them are scattered around the room so as questions arise if you uh, have uh, particularly tricky questions to ask. We've got some colleagues here who might be able to help with some of those. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll say it now, I'll probably say it again at the end. Please, if there's anything about um, running your charities that is of concern to you, pick up the phone, speak to the, the team in Dundee. We are a regulator, but we try and be a helpful, um, supportive regulator. Uh, we're not just there to kind of deal with the heavy <coughs> end of stuff. Uh, we really want to give you as much support as we can uh, with the important job that you do running your charity. So we are there uh, to help. But I just want to go on now and, and say a little bit about three of the areas that um, we've been focusing on lately. So a bit more about public trust, <coughs> say a little bit about fraud and cybercrime, and then just focus on some of the guidance that we've uh, got in the pipeline or produced recently. So trust. Every um, couple of years we um, commission uh, two surveys, one of the general public uh, and one across charities. So many of you will remember getting a questionnaire. Um, I think we had quite a big sample this year of charities. There's a good chance that many of you in the room uh, were contacted by the researchers um, and asked what you thought of us. So. Uh, you're about to find out what, uh, what the results of that was. And we also contact members of the public uh, and find out um, how they're feeling about Charity Matters. Now, we were a bit nervous this year because the questions were being asked in the week when the Oxfam scandal was all over the newspapers and in the media, so we were braced for some disappointing results, but uh, in actual fact, the levels of trust held up pretty well. So uh, despite all of that going on, uh, the public in Scotland seemed to uh, feel that their levels of trust um, hadn't changed much from two years ago. So there's a lot in the, in the surveys. We're just picking out some of the key information here. If you're interested, please go to the website, uh, delve into the details. You've also got some uh, of the information on that colourful handout on, on the tables. But 81% of charities say that uh, they understand having the public's trust and confidence uh, is important in terms of that donation. Worries me what the other 19% think, but um, that's a reasonably high number. 76%, um, and I think this is the public, say that knowing how much goes to the cause increases their trust. So you'll hear regulators like us saying a lot about transparency and openness and the importance of telling your story, and you're going to hear a bit more about that, I'm sure, later. Um, in order to um, persuade people to part with their hard-earned cash, 
um, if you can demonstrate quite clearly what you do with it, how much of it goes through uh, to help the cause at the charities, that, that will persuade people. So people have a, a legitimate question about money going off into overheads or other activity. I won't get bogged down in that debate. We, we're not sure that there is such a thing as, as overheads. Um, anything that's required to run a charity is making a contribution to the cause. But people do have an interest in what um, happens at the front line and being able to demonstrate that clearly uh, is a way of improving trust. Fortunately for us, 84% of the, of the public said that um, charity regulation was important, so that's good. They didn't always know that um, there was a body called OSCAR, but they have a sense that um, charity should be regulated independently. And this is a, a slightly different thing. The last statistic there is that 72% of people say evidence of the achievements increases trust. So part of running your charity well is telling that story so that your existing supporters and potential new supporters get a clear sense of what happens um, after they've donated, uh, when they've volunteered or given support. So telling that story about the impact you achieve, a really important job uh, for, for trustees. So five different things you could, you could do. Tell the public you are a registered charity. Um, it is a legal requirement on your websites, on your published material to uh, display your charity number. We've got a logo and I think you'll, you'll see that in a minute if you haven't seen it already. It's free to download, it's easy uh, on the Scottish Charity Register. You can include that in your material and it does have a, a real impact on people's confidence seeing clearly that you're a registered charity. Um, Run your charity well. Um, we know uh, the, the dedication of charity trustees. Uh, it's a huge kind of volunteer um, labour force that keeps charities running. Uh, and you know we don't underestimate how difficult that can be. Sometimes disputes arise. Um, sometimes you'll have funding challenges, operational challenges things to deal with that as volunteers is asking quite a lot of you. Um, but the public does expect a charity to operate to a high standard of governance uh, and that's the key role of the trustee. File your accounts on time and uh, stop, stop our team having to send out kind of increasingly um, uh, grumpy reminders. Uh, nine months after the end of your business year that's the point at which your annual return should be made. Uh, most of you manage that. Um, there are a few we have to chase. I mentioned this already. Tell your story. Show the difference you've made. Uh, use your trust trustee's annual report, not just um, as a legal account of what happened at your AGM, uh, but use it as an opportunity to tell your story um, and use whatever imaginative means you have at your disposal uh, to get that message out there. And if you have changes that you think uh, we might want to know about, uh, please let us know. Don't just wait until your annual return uh, comes in. If there are significant changes, uh, it's a good idea just to keep your register entry up to date. And here it is. This is uh, what the logo looks like. Anyone downloaded it recently? No, oh, there's a wee hand. Was it all right? Was it painless? Good. There we are. Good. So, moving on a little bit from the evidence around trust and, and what helps there, focus a little bit on some of the uh, risks and pitfalls that are out there. Um, two years ago, I, I went on a, on a wee bit of a, an internal secondment, so... I went back into Scottish Government and worked in their digital directorate and uh, it was part of the effort to get our heads around this digital world that we now live in. And, and we used to say it's not a digital future, it is now. It is a digital present, it is a reality. Uh, being digital is just the way the world is now uh, and for charities therefore embracing that and accepting the reality of operating in a world that's increasingly online, uh, where most people are getting their information through their phone, 
Um, that's just the, the reality of how we live, and therefore it's a reality that charities have to deal with. And there are tremendously positive things that come with all of that, but there are also uh, some risks. Um, and fraud, cybercrime, um, as charity trustees, you need to be just aware. Uh, so it's not just looking after the cash box and keeping your people safe, but there are information risks um, and there are um, just simple protections that you can put in place. So you know about this in your private life, it's the same uh, within your charities. Be very careful about um, phishing emails um, or bogus um, contacts, particularly around banking information. Uh, ransomware, very difficult, um, that, that does happen. Charities are no less exempt from that than, than other walks of life, so uh, very, very difficult to deal with those kind of attacks. Viruses, make sure that you um, keep all your software up to date, that you apply the patches, that your, um, your um, kind of spyware and everything is, is updated regularly because the hackers are continually developing new things, so you must keep your defences up to date as best you can. And increasingly, um, in the run-up to May, when GDPR was all we heard about, um, thinking about data, uh, you will hold data, some of it personal, some of it sensitive personal data. Just be sure that you are observing the requirements of data protection uh, in order to keep information about your um, volunteers and your staff um, as safe as, as they would expect. We do have a, a fact sheet um, on this, both on cybercrime uh, and on fraud, so if you think that's something you might want to just um, brush up your knowledge on, uh, those are all available on the website. And in terms of other guidance, um, we, a couple of years ago, produced guidance around fundraising uh, when there was a review of how fundraising was regulated. Uh, by and large, it's self-regulated, but there is a role for the regulator behind that to make sure that trustees understand their responsibilities. So we do have guidance um, around fundraising. The one in the centre, that would be the thing I would direct any new trustee to. Being a charity in Scotland, that's really the best place to start um, if you want the introduction to what's involved and what that means for trustees. Uh, that's really uh, the best starting point. And recently we've produced some guidance on charities and trading. In the pipeline are updates on the guidance about Scottish Charitable Incorporated Organisations, SCIOs as they're affectionately known. Those of you who are a SCIO will know what that's all about. It's a very popular new legal form. We've got about 3,500 SCIOs now on the charity register. So it's a way of um, protecting trustees without full incorporation as a company. So it's a purpose-designed legal vehicle that gives you some of the benefits of incorporation without having to register with Companies House. So the SCIO is proving to be a very popular uh, new legal form. Uh, we'll be updating our guidance on consents, on accounts, um, and our guidance for independent examiners. And then the last one there is new guidance. Uh, some charities were asking about investments, so we've had a working group uh, with uh, support from Laura Anderson lurking at the back there. So that group will shortly be issuing new guidance around investments. So as I say, there's a whole range of specific pieces of guidance available. If there are particular technical issues that you're facing, you might find an answer on the website. But it's not just Oscar who will help you. Um, the charitable sector um, does what it says on the tin, and there's lots of offer, offers of help um, wherever you might want to go. So Institute of Fundraising maintain the code of practice on fundraising. Volunteer Scotland will help you uh, find volunteers, and uh, that includes trustee positions. So if you're looking for committee members or new board members, uh, Volunteer Scotland can help you. Uh, Scottish Mediation, 
we often say that a lot of things that get resolved to, to the regulator might be better dealt with through mediation. Uh, so they might be a source if you've got uh, some interpersonal strains around your board or between your board and your staff. Uh, we know these things happen. Sometimes mediation's uh, as good a way of, of sorting it out as any. Locally, uh, EVOC is one of the third sector interface organisations. Every local authority area has a third sector interface. So uh, Edinburgh uh, has a very strong uh, organisation who will help bodies who think they might want to become charities or bodies who already are charities and are facing some problems. So that's a great source um, of support. SCVO, most of you know who SCVO are. Um, we've got some at the back of the room there. Nice to see uh, Tracy and Rhonda. They're not always kind of together. I, I, I actually, <laughs> I did see them separately the other day, so it's a rare sight to see one or the other. But uh, we, we work very closely with SCVO uh, and they're there with a lot of advice for members and for, for known members. A lot of useful advice for trustees. And uh, the Good Governance Award um, is uh, obviously a, an accolade that you can apply to, but uh, I think most of you will know that there's also been a lot of consultation recently about a Good Governance uh, Code for Scotland. Uh, Pat's organisation, ACOSVO, has been very heavily involved in that, uh, as have we. So there will soon be a third sector uh, governance code that's a useful checklist for your organisations. I know some of you will have contributed to the consultation around that. So it's always good to just um, look at the, the frameworks of good governance uh, and use that as an assessment about how your own organisation is measuring up. Lots of ways of keeping in touch with what we do. We are on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on YouTube. Um, so please subscribe to our newsletter uh, but please try and keep up to date. And that's really all I want to say. I hope that's uh, given you some sense of what goes on in the uh, office in Dundee uh, and given you an introduction to who we are and, and what we do. As I say, we might have time. I don't know how we're doing time-wise. Might have time for a, for a few questions now. Uh, I'll be here all afternoon and we've got lots of colleagues around. If there's things you want to ask us but you don't necessarily want the whole room to hear about, um, please uh, grab us in one of the breaks uh, and we'll do what we can to help. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you for listening. And I'll now go and sit down and take any difficult questions you've got for me. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's lovely to be here. It's uh, definitely one of the favourite parts of my job, coming out and talking to people, talking to trustees, talking to people who work in charities. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Oh, Ian, am I standing in the wrong place? <laughs> I like to move around and I'm not allowed to move around. Um, also, just to say that this mic is gently choking me. So if I go kind of blue and fall over, would somebody come and pick me up? Um, what we're going to do uh, in a very brief presentation really is talk a little bit about uh, our definitions of safeguarding and a little bit beyond that, but we're con concentrating on safeguarding today. Talk a little bit about why it's important, um, how charity trustee duties intersect with that, what you need to be thinking about as charity trustees. I talk, just briefly touch on the notifiable events regime and you might have some questions on that and then talk about our safeguarding steps. Um, one of the things that happened when all this safeguarding stuff hit the press was there was quite a conflation, uh, quite a bringing together of different concepts in one place, making it quite confusing, I think, for charity trustees and others. And one of the things we've tried hard to do in our guidance, we've got interim guidance up on the website at the moment. Um, it's very close to the final guidance, but because we're doing a lot of thinking about this at the moment, we've left it as interim for the time being. But what we tried to do was be very clear about what we were talking about in that guidance, but some of the other stuff that you needed to get right as well in order to make sure safeguarding was working in your organisation. So what do we mean by safeguarding? 
For us, safeguarding is the action that an organisation will take to promote the well-being of the beneficiaries, of vulnerable beneficiaries, children and vulnerable adults. And that includes physical, emotional and all that stuff. That is the very heart. That is safeguarding. However, as we all know, if you want to get safeguarding right as an organisation, you need to make sure other stuff is right. You need to make sure your organisation is working properly. You need to make sure it's a safe and secure people, place for people to work. You need to make sure your employment, your employment laws, your employment procedures are correct. And you've kind of got to build an organisational culture that really works to make sure that safeguarding is, is, is working appropriately in your organisation. So that is what safeguarding is for us, that, that middle bit, that heart in the middle there. And that's the heart of what charity trustees need to be thinking about. So why is it important? I mean, obviously that's kind of almost a stupid question, but why is it important? Um, it's not just, it's not important for any, you know, um, any reputational reason, although that kind of comes into the overall trust and confidence that people might have in the sector. Fundamentally, it's a right of beneficiaries to feel safe of vulnerable beneficiaries to feel safe, to be treated with dignity and respect. That is the very heart. That is why it's important to us as a regulator and to charity trustees um, as a whole. But in a way, people often say, well, you know, should charities be held to a higher level of, of, of scrutiny than others? I don't think so, really. I think any organisation should be held to the same level of, of scrutiny. But it's absolutely definitely true that charities often play a very particular role in society. They're often trusted to look after the most vulnerable populations, the most vulnerable beneficiaries. So in fact, there's a particular role there that charities have, and therefore it becomes even more important that charities get this bit right. And there is that kind of transparency bit if, if, if about reporting. There's, a, there's another reason why uh, people got very upset about the stuff that went on in the newspapers. Um, uh, newspapers, I sound very old fashioned, newspapers and everywhere else, um, was that there was a lack, it, it was felt that there was a lack of transparency and that people weren't being truthful and honest about what was going on. And a big part of what builds trust and confidence in charities is that transparency bit, is that truthful bit, is people knowing that they can trust you as an organisation. And finally, and this is not the most important bit, sometimes, you know, we put this in and people go, well, it's not just about reputation. No, it's not just about reputation. But if you get any of this safeguarding stuff wrong, as we saw recently, then it will not just undermine the, 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 the faith and the trust that people have in your charity. It will also undermine possibly the trust that people have in other charities across the sector and the sector as a whole. So it is a very, very important piece to get right. I'm not going to talk about charity trustees duties in detail because that is the, the fantastic Laura Anderson's job and she will do that brilliantly in a minute. But charity trustees duties speak very directly to this piece of work. Because um, if you look at the second one there, you must act with care and diligence. First of all, you must act in the interest of the charity, but you must act with care and diligence. And if you think about your charity and you think about who you're working with and you think about your beneficiaries, then actually acting with care and diligence really talks to how you're looking after that population. And when we talk about acting with care and diligence, and Laura will go into this in more detail, then we're really talking about a, a, a level of care that goes way beyond the level of care that you, that you would think about looking after your own affairs, but actually a level of care looking after somebody else's affair. So it's quite a high level of proof. So act with care and diligence, and therefore making sure that you get safeguarding right for your beneficiaries is a key part of what uh, of what ch trustees are charged with doing in charity law down here and Laura will talk about this in, in a bit more detail is it's a collective responsibility so while as an organization if you're a big charity you'll be delegating a lot of what that that practical kind of safeguarding stuff you'll be delegating that you'll be thinking about you know how that fits into your policies and procedures but overall it's a collective responsibility of the charity trustees of your board of your committee of whatever it's called to make sure that that piece uh, you're getting that piece right so what you should be doing the first point is actually about that wider environmental stuff but one of the key things to getting safeguarding right in your organization not surprisingly is making sure you've got the policies and procedures in place However, it's not just about getting some nice shiny policy that you pick off some you know, website or, or somebody gives you um, and you go, well, that's great, we've got a policy, tick, tick, tick. As we all know, and I'm sure you all have great experience of this, is actually making sure it's embedded in your organisation and then it's fit for purpose. 
there was quite a lot of, um, one might say, slightly knee-jerk reactions after the stuff hit the press uh, recently to say, well, get a policy in place in, in four weeks or we won't give you, you know, we can't give you any more cash. That's never going to work. If you want to get an appropriate policy, you need to work with your beneficiaries, you need to work with your staff, you need to work with your other trustees to make sure you're getting it right. So it's not just about having a policy, it's not just about having a procedure, but it's making sure that that's embedded in your organisation and that you have clear lines of responsibility, that people know what they need to be doing. That's something that often falls down. That you might have a great policy, you might have a great procedure, but because you're not keeping them up to date, because perhaps you're not doing the training, because perhaps you don't have the time to actually invest in this stuff, then what's happening is people are not clear about what they're meant to be doing, and that's where it can actually go wrong. And then you need to make sure you're being transparent about when things go wrong, so reporting issues to the appropriate authorities. Now, as David said, very often on, on serious safeguarding issues, we are not, we are not the safeguarding police. You know, we're, we're the charity regulator. What we are concerned about is that trustees are doing the right thing. But we do have a reporting regime, but there will be other people that you need to be reporting to if stuff goes wrong. I'm going to talk a little bit about notifiable events um, to make that clear for you. So that's what you should be doing. I'm going to talk briefly about our notifiable events regime. And there may be people, I'm not going to ask people to put up their hands, <laughs> who's had a notifiable event with Oscar. But we've had quite a number, <laughs> we've had quite a number over um, the last two years. It's only been, in, it's only really been going now for two and a half years. Um, and in total, we've probably had about, between, we've had about 200 notifiable events over that time. But that's over all the different areas that we ask people to notify, notify us on. Um, and for instance, what, what David was talking about, fraud and cybercrime, <laughs> that's actually our biggest number of stuff that's coming in in terms of notifiable events. It's, it's definitely not safeguarding. But what is the regime and why is it there? Well, we started the regime because the idea was really that we wanted to get ahead of the problems. If we want to be a proportionate and preventative regulator, we need to support charity trustees to do that. So rather than wait till some problem gets really naughty and it's not solved and then all the trustees walk away and then it's a total disaster and then it's the press and it's all mess, we're asking people to report to us at a time that they've had some time to think about what's happening, that they know what they're going to be doing about that, that the trustees have had time to kind of actually take some action on that or, or decide what action they're going to take and then report it to us. And of all the ones that we've had, very uh, fortunately, um, and maybe not surprisingly, because it's usually organisations with very good governance that report to us, um, we rarely have to do very much. What happens is somebody will report to us um, they have already taken the steps or they're, they're very clear about what steps they're going to take and then we go, oh that's great, thanks very much, keep us updated, maybe if there's some, something in the future. For a few of them, we have to signpost and say, well actually maybe you need to think about this, we'll maybe signpost to some support, um, we'll maybe say, oh well actually you, know, you haven't reported that fraud to the, you know, the appropriate place, etc, etc, so we'll do some signposting. And only in a couple of cases have we had to actually escalate that to become an inquiry. But even when we've done that, the, the charity trustees who've reported that to us are clear that that's the step we're going to take. So it means we're all much better informed at the right time to be able to take the right action. And it puts us all in a much stronger position because on, on a couple of occasions already, we've been able to say when some, um, some kind of, uh, some kind of, some reporter has called up and said, oh, terrible story here about blah, 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 blah. What, what, what are you doing about it? And we can say, well, actually, we've heard about this. The trustees are doing something about it. All good, nothing to look at. It puts us all in a stronger position. We can all be much more comfortable about what, what is going on within the charity. And it's more of a problem, in fact, if people don't report to us. So if, 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 if something has happened that's pretty serious in your charity and you haven't reported to us and then we discover it because somebody else has raised a concern and we have to go in and, and, and open an inquiry on that, then we're much more likely to think, mm, governance here not so great because, in fact, they're not being transparent at the right moments with the, with the regulator. Now, people who have read the guidance sometimes say, well, it's not prescriptive enough. You're not telling us what, you, what, what, what it is that we need to tell you. And we have kept it fairly high level, and that's for a very good reason. The good reason being that there's 24,000 charities that are all doing different things, and, and what is a notifiable event for one charity will not necessarily be a notifiable event for another. Now, I won't use the safeguarding to, to make an example here. It's much better thinking about, say, financial loss. If you're an organisation that is a £50,000 organisation and you've lost a grant for 30000 that you've had for the last 10 years, 
Well, that opens you up to the possibility of having to think about winding up. You may not be able to carry on anymore. There's some risks associated with that, and we can be much more helpful with the wind-up process before um, this all happens rather than after. So you might want to inform us about that. If you are a £10 million organisation, how many £10 million organisations do we have in the room? <laughs> oh, good, good, we do. <laughs> That's very nice. Not very many, because most of them will be small. But if you are a £10 million organisation and you lose a £30,000 grant, that is probably not a notifiable event because that is not going to affect your ongoing running of the organisation. It's not going to undermine your organisation. You're not likely to have to wind up. So you wouldn't report that to us. So it is something that the trustees have to decide is something that is a risk to their organisation. It should be very much linked up to the way that the organisation is managing risk. In terms of safeguarding, the same is true. However, of course, uh, we would always say that with safeguarding events in an organisation, charity trustees should be erring on the side of caution. If you feel something significant is happening there, some safeguarding event is happening, then you may want to uh, alert us to that. You probably will want us to alert us to that. Um, we would say, again, that you do need time as charity trustees to, to have some understanding of what's going on and have some understanding of what you're going to do about it before you report. So um, when we say report to us as soon as you can, it does mean to have some consideration. But with safeguarding events, again, we would err on the side of caution of reporting relatively early because these are the kind of events that can maybe hit the press or can become quite serious quite quickly. So um, again, it's up to the charity trustees to decide at the right moment to report to us, but to make sure that these, these, these very, very critical safeguarding events are reported to us at the, at the earliest possible opportunity. Now, again, we know there's safeguarding events that will not be reported to us. We know, and um, we've seen, we've had a couple of meetings with, say, big care providers. And the safeguarding events that have to be reported to the care inspector and so on, when you know, there's been just a slight uh, misadministration of medicine or so on, very tiny safeguarding events would not be things that would threaten the fabric of your organisation, would not be things <laughs> that were highly risky. So, again, your organisation will have a good understanding of the risks your organisation is facing, and we do only want to hear about the things that are notifiable because in this day and age when we talk about getting the data that we get to be able to use it appropriately, we don't want lots of stuff that you just have to you know, regurgitate to us that's not going to be useful either to us or to yourselves. Um, so maybe just to go back on that safeguarding bit, err on the side of caution if you have a, a, a serious safeguarding issue, we would want to hear about it, but we would still want you to have time to think about it, to consider what you're going to do so that you can actually reassure us as charity trustees that you know what you're going to do, that you know how you're going to go forward with that particular problem that you have in your organisation. You may want to ask questions about that after. What are we doing at the moment? We've produced our interim guidance, so hopefully people have had a chance to look at that. We've got a little video um, uh, about, uh, basically about the key principles of the guidance. Um, I think the most important thing that we're doing is that, that we're trying to work with key partners across the sector to build up confidence in this area of work. Um, we have seen, is since the stuff hit the press, we've seen a lot of very good practice on safeguarding. Um, what we want to do is to try to make sure that we can make, um, the, do what we can to make sure the practice can be as good across the whole of the charity sector within Scotland, or certainly the charity sector that's working with vulnerable beneficiaries. So we're working with um, other partners, with Scottish Government, with SCVO particularly, to try to look at what we can do um, to actually build up um, strength in this area of work. Uh, and that will include safeguarding, but it will also start to work on some of these other issues that are very important that organisations need to be getting right, uh, such as whistleblowing or um, cultural change and all those kind of things which are a bit more difficult to work on in a concrete way. So we'll be looking at how we can support the sector on those areas as well going forward. Just going to finish with our little steps that are in our guidance, um, with sort of a bit of a recap. The first thing to, to really, that you really need to do is to make sure that you know what your duties are. So that whole, you know, what are your charity trustees' duties and understand that safeguarding falls very clearly within some of those. Know your other statutory duties. Depending on your organisation, you will probably have duties towards other, um, other um, regulators. Be appropriately trained. And I think the appropriateness is very important because, again, um, a simple safeguarding policy that works well 
um, is, is much better than a very fancy, you know, gold-plated safeguarding policy that doesn't work at all. So getting an appropriate policy and making sure that, that your staff are trained in that is very important. Um, and, and building it into the, the, the approach that your organisation takes to risk is pretty fundamental. Policies and procedures, I've talked about that, and making sure that they're implemented and understood and that people understand what their roles are in that uh, and that it's embedded in, in, in an overall culture within an organisation that sees safeguarding as just something that you do, it's just something that's embedded in your organisation, it's just something that everybody understands what their role is and, and they're doing it on a day-to-day -day basis. What's also very important in terms of this wider cultural issue is making sure that you have good concern raising um, policies. And this is true for anything. It's particularly true for safeguarding. But when we talked about fundraising a couple of years ago, which was my last big hobby horse, that was, um, that was, a, that was also a big thing. Do you, do you have the appropriate procedures within the charity to make sure that people can raise concerns safely and they feel confident in being able to do so? And that you, have a, that you know that you can deal with them, that you're, you're safe and you're confident enough to be able to deal with these concerns. And then when something does happen, because I think this is the important piece of the puzzle that's always important to admit, you would, could have the best policies and procedures, you could have the best employment policies, you could have the best ways of dealing with stuff, but sometimes people just do horrible things. So if you do get an incident that, 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 that shakes you up a bit and that kind of is very <coughs> negative in terms of safeguarding for your organisation, that is a good opportunity to learn from and reflect, check that your policies are right. They may be right, if not, change them. Did something fall down in your procedure? Did something fall down in the way that people understood their roles and responsibilities? And then learn from that and then make sure that uh, you update your policies and procedures accordingly. So that's me. Um, but now I'm going to hand you over to the exciting bit because we've got uh, Volunteer Scotland who are going to talk about the duty to refer. What we are going to talk about is the duty to refer, which is if you are a charity or any other organisation that is working with children or protected adults, then under the PVG legislation, you have a legal requirement to pass on information to the PVG barring lists if the relevant criteria are met. That being if somebody has behaved in an inappropriate fashion towards a vulnerable individual or individuals, within your group. Now, at present, there are around about 5,700 people across the country who are barred from doing the regulated work with vulnerable individuals. As you see there, we've got it split into three different sections. The red section, the biggest part there, is 64% of 5,700 people are barred from working with children. It is therefore an offence for you as an organisation to employ any of those individuals in a position that falls under the PVG scheme that is working with children. Same way there, 9.5% are barred from working with adults. You cannot employ individuals who are barred from working with adults in an adult position that falls under the PVG scheme. And there you've got 26.5% are barred from working with both children and adults within the PVG scheme. So they cannot do any regulated work at all under PVG. But for the system to work, for people to be put on to these barring lists, as we say, it is a legal requirement for you, if you are an organisation that is doing the work, to pass on information if the criteria are met. That being, first off, the individual is permanently removed from the regulated work that they have been doing. Now, that can be you as an organisation dismiss them, that can be they resign, that can be particularly sort of in the charitable sector, the funding for a project ends and they leave. For whatever reason, if they have been permanently removed from the regulated work, that's the first part of the criteria. The second part there being that the grounds have been met, those grounds being that they have behaved in an inappropriate fashion in one or more of the five headings there towards vulnerable individuals. So they have, for example, physically caused them harm. They have placed somebody at risk of harm through, for example, a lack of health and safety. They have engaged in inappropriate conduct involving pornography. They have engaged in inappropriate sexual conduct. They've been saying things of a sexual nature to vulnerable individuals that you would not want them to do. 
they have also been, for example, giving inappropriate medical treatment. So if any of you are involved in organisations where it is involved, uh, for example, giving out medication to individuals at certain times, somebody who refuses to give out that medication would be classed as being behaving in an inappropriate fashion. Can also cover, for example, the supply of illegal and unauthorised drugs. Now, what is deemed to be inappropriate behaviour? We've got a list there. So we're starting off with the more serious items, sexual abuse, physical assault, supplying the illegal or unauthorised drugs, emotional abuse, coercion, neglect, inappropriate physical restraint, as we said, failure to follow health and safety, the use of inappropriate language. You're working with vulnerable individuals. What you deem to be inappropriate within the five headings is going to fall down to who you're working with in terms of the vulnerable individuals and what work your staff, your volunteers are doing with those individuals. And if they are behaving in an inappropriate fashion and you do permanently remove them, then as we say, you are legally required to pass on the information to the PVG system. So that inappropriate behaviour, though, it has to be against children. It has to be against protected adults. So I keep picking on David here when I'm doing these. So he's been doing a wide selection of criminal offences over the past few weeks, it has to be said. So David earlier was talking about, you know, Oscar gets its funding from the Scottish Government. So tomorrow, Oscar finds out David spent all the money on his, you know, holidays in the Caribbean. You know, Oscar wouldn't have to pass that information to the PVG system because David's not doing work with children with protected adults. But if David was the head, let's say, of an adult project for people with dementia and he siphoned money from those individuals to fund his holidays, then if the organisation removes them, that would be a referral ground because that is inappropriate behaviour towards a vulnerable adult. He has, for example, you know, uh, neglected that person's need by using money that was for their care to spend on his trip to the Caribbean. You're not planning on going to the Caribbean, we have to say at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing about the inappropriate behaviour is it also doesn't have to be whilst the person is actually working for you. If you decide to remove an individual from the work that they are doing with you with vulnerable individuals because information has been passed to you about their general behaviour, let's say, outside of work, then you can remove that individual and refer them to the PVG scheme. So, for example, we'll go with Jude this time. Somebody comes to you tomorrow and says, did you know Jude's been arrested for hitting a child, uh, you know, on Prince's Street? And we said, oh, no, didn't know that. We're a children's organisation. We discover that Jude has actually been arrested and charged with hitting a child, assaulting a child. If we then remove her, even though the inappropriate behaviour hasn't been while she's been physically working for us, the referral grounds are still met. You still have to make the referral because that removal has been caused by her being inappropriate towards a vulnerable individual. Allegedly, we should say, yes. We should, well, hmm, don't know about that. Uh, an individual who you are reporting to the PVG system we should say at this point, there does not have to be a conviction through a court of law for that person to be barred and placed on the, uh, on the barred list under the PVG system. The PVG system is working that that in, on the basis that the individual is going to be barred on the balance of probability that they have behaved you know, inappropriately towards a vulnerable person. So there doesn't have to be a situation arising where you dismiss the individual and pass that information on to the police for them to take it through the courts, etc. It is just if you remove the individual, because as we got there at the bottom, you know, the use of inappropriate language. So I don't know if any of you are, for example, sports organisations. If you've got a coach who's continually swearing at the children that he's coaching, you might say, nope, we're going to remove you. That would be a referral matter under the PVG system, but you wouldn't have to pass that on to the police. Other side of that as well is you should not rely, if it is a police matter, 
on giving the information to the police and then passing it to the PVG system. If that individual does end up being barred through a court process, etc., then uh, Andrew, who's from Disclosure Scotland at the back there, and his colleagues, they will look at the system to see whether or not you as an organisation have placed a referral into the system because you are legally required to do so. So no matter what the circumstances, if the criteria are met, you should make the referral to the PVG system. Now, something that does come up from time to time, what if information is passed to you and the individual has already left your organisation. They've already gone. Somebody who's, you know, in receipt of your services, didn't want to say anything because they were being bullied by a staff member, by a volunteer. If that person is gone, allegations are made, you investigate that allegation. And if your conclusion is that at the end of your investigation, you would have removed that person if they were still working for you, then you are still legally required to make the referral to the barring lists, even though the person is no longer there. And that's a sort of, uh, questions bit. I will now answer the question at the front end, which was, are you required to do the PVG checks? Right. Uh, this may come as a shock to some individuals here. Technically, it is not a legal requirement to do a PVG check. Uh, under the current PVG legislation, it is effectively your decision as an organisation as to who you would PVG check and when you would PVG check them. However, we do have to say that if you are found, for example, to be employing a barred individual, uh, then technically you could be in breach of the PVG legislation. And the only way you can find out if an individual is barred is by doing a PVG check. Uh, so technically it's not a mandatory system, but if you like, it's sort of mandatory by the back door. And we should say at this point that the PVG legislation, uh, for those of you who know it was out for public consultation earlier in the year about making changes to the system. And part of those changes are that come the implementation of the amendments, hopefully in <laughs> 2020, the PVG system will become mandatory at that point. So if you are doing what's currently regulated work and what may be a protected rules going forward, then you will be legally required to do the checks for everybody who does meet the criteria. In preparation for having a wee bit of discussion towards the end of the session, what I'd like you to, to kind of bear in mind as we go through the next few slides are the kind of key points and experiences that pre you've perhaps had acting in the role of a charity trustee, or perhaps you've worked with a client, um, a group of charity trustees, and particular challenges have maybe come up. So that's what I'd like you to sort of bear in mind. So let's start off with then the basics. Okay. Who is a charity trustee? What is a charity trustee? Let's be clear about who we're actually talking about, okay? There are a lot of very commonly used descriptors um, for those who are undertaking a trustee role. The slide here illustrates just a few of those that you've possibly heard and you've possibly used yourself, actually. The key point to remember, however, is that no matter how you term um, a group of charity trustees or an individual charity trustee, everyone undertaking that role has the same responsibilities in the eyes of the law. And we're going to look at those responsibilities in detail and a little bit later on. Charity law defines charity trustees as those persons having general control and management of the administration of a charity. It sounds quite grand and quite complex, really. But essentially, these people are the members of the group that governs the running of the charity, the board. Okay? And as the previous slide showed, often there are many different names that can be used. Ultimately, it doesn't matter what the individuals are called. The key here is the role that they play, the fact they're in control of the organisation and the responsibilities that they hold. So... I'm going to start off by doing something probably fairly unusual in many ways. I'm going to level with you. I'm going to be very, very honest with you. Being a charity trustee is not all plain sailing. And if I'm honest with you, sometimes it can be really tough. 
Those of you in the room that are charity trustees currently or have been in the past, you'll know exactly what it is I'm talking about. So the question's got to be then, why would you actually take the role on? Often I think commitment to the cause is the key reason why people become involved. For example, maybe the purpose of the charity is particularly close to their heart, or maybe it relates to their local community. There's a clear dedication, therefore, to the cause or the reason that the charity actually exists, okay, and what it's really trying to achieve, which is definitely, I would say, needed by trustees. And all of that will mean that they'll be really committed and passionate about making a difference and trying to achieve that charitable purpose. So in fulfilling the role of a charity trustee, we've established that it's necessary, obviously, to have a clear commitment to the cause and to what the charity is actually aiming to do. But it's also really necessary to be very clear on what comes with being a charity trustee. What are the practical implications of actually taking on the role? Being a charity trustee carries with it enormous responsibility as well as great rewards. So what I'm going to then con um, continue on to do is a bit of a refresher on what the charity trustee duties are that are set out in law. As I said earlier though, it won't always be easy. There will be tough times, there'll be times when you feel like really giving up and just throwing in the towel. But when you get to that stage, I would say that's the right time to re really do um, a re refresher for yourself and think about the commitment, the enthusiasm and the passion for the charity's cause, okay? And that should hopefully see you through those difficult times. Before, however, we see exactly what the law says about duties and responsibilities, I think it's probably quite good to press just the pause button just for a little minute. Because we need to remember that being a charity trustee is not a task for a lone wolf. It's not something that you undertake in isolation. But although sometimes you might feel like that if you've been in that charity trustee role, but a really critical part of the charity trustee role is working with your fellow trustees to ensure that the charity can achieve its purposes by carrying out its activities. When there are tough times, it's important that everyone pulls together for the very good of that organisation, supporting each other, ensuring everyone's views and skills are really used to best effect. And when we're talking about charity trustees and governance, there's a really key principle that I'd ask you all to bear in mind, and that's the one of collective responsibility. Because all charity trustees are responsible for the actions of the charity and the decisions that are taken within that organisation. And that, of course, reinforces the point that trustees need to work together. They need to share information. They need to be confident that the decisions that they are making are robust and they can be easily explained if they're challenged on those decisions. When we're looking at the role of the charity trustee and what it means in practice, I often think it's quite helpful to really go right back to basics and revisit the charity's governing document, which is really part of the rule book for charity trustees. Ideally, it should set out the purposes of the charity, the, per the powers sorry, of charity trustees, and how they should be governing the charity. But it's pretty fair to say that governing documents quite often are a little scant in their detail, it has to be said. If that's the case in your charity, then it's worthwhile, I would say, looking to see if you've got powers to make amendments to your governing document. And that will allow you perhaps to be a little bit more explicit about what you do and how you do it. And that's a really good asset, I would say, in your governance toolkit. I mentioned earlier that charity trustees have legal duties which are set out in law. And as you would expect, these are actions and behaviours that trustees have to demonstrate and carry out because they are legal requirements. There's no choice for trustees to make about whether or not these are appropriate. They apply to every trustee of every charity that we have on the Scottish Charity Register. Okay? And what we're going to cover in the next few slides is an explanation of what those duties actually are and what they really look like at a very practical level. Charity law in Scotland sets out two overarching duties for trustees. The first is that charity trustees need to act in the interests of the charity at all times. In terms of what that comes down to in practice, we have the need to make decisions that are the best for the charity. Not for the trustees, not for them as a group or as individuals, not for their family, not for their friends or their associated business interests. Okay? It's really focusing very clearly on what the charity as an organisation needs. And of course, that can change from time to time. 
The second element that trustees have to comply with um, is specific duties, um, which are set out in the 2005 Act. And again, I'm going to cover those in a little more detail. So keeping that duty to act in the interest of the charity in your mind, I would say that helps to kind of frame this slide and the next few. We talked earlier about the charity's purposes being what the charity has been established at to actually do. And all of the activities that the charity carries out have to be in furtherance of that purpose, be that directly or indirectly. And when I talk about indirectly, I would give you an example of perhaps raising money in order to then spend on activities which directly further the charity's purpose. But ultimately, it comes down to focusing on what the activities need to be to deliver the purpose. The key thing here is for charity trustees to make sure that they understand the purpose of the organisation. Go right back to basics, right back to that governing document if you need to do so. Because you want to ensure that there hasn't been any mission creep, which has unknowingly become kind of common and accepted practice within the charity. Quite often we see issues with quite long established charities. They've kind of crept away over a quite a long period of time perhaps from actually what they were set up to do. Okay? In ensuring that the charity is acting in line with its purposes, charity trustees have to act honestly and reasonably also in achieving those purposes. And they must ensure that all the assets of the charity are used for those purposes and nothing else. Okay? There can't be any expenditure that doesn't directly or indirectly contribute to the furtherance of those purposes. Jude talked a bit earlier in her presentation about acting with due care and diligence, one of the key um, elements of the, the general duties of charity trustees. And as she mentions, it's generally easiest to think about this as the standard of care that you would apply if you were dealing with someone else's money instead of your own. Okay? And that's exactly what charity trustees are ultimately doing because they are dealing with the funds of the charity and not their own property. Okay? Now, ultimately, that should engender really carefully considered behaviour on the part of charity trustees, and I'm sure you'd all agree with that. But sometimes I think it can be very difficult to think about really what it means in practice. The concept is one that you'll agree with and you'll see the sense in, but what does it actually boil down to? I would say a good place to start is actually when you're thinking about decision making. Okay? If charity trustees are acting in the interest of the charity, then that means they should be protecting the charity, including its beneficiaries and all of its assets, including its reputation. Trustees, of course, need to have appropriate information to be able to make sound decisions and act, to act carefully. It's a real, real mistake to try and make a decision with only half of the information that you actually really need to be able to make that decision properly. So, for instance, it will be really important for trustees to understand the financial position of their organisation when they're making decisions about how to spend money or maybe how to invest the charity's money. They need to understand the implications of making certain key choices. And they can't simply devolve the responsibility for understanding finances to maybe just the treasurer or a couple of charity trustees. Everyone on the board should at least understand the basics of the charity's finances so that they can properly contribute to the discussions and the decisions that trustees are trying to make. More widely, of course, it's not just finance that trustees need to know and understand. It's also risks that the charity faces more generally that trustees need to be aware of so that, again, they can contribute effectively to good decision making. And decisions also need to be made in line with the requirements which are set out in the governing document of the charity. If they're not, they may end up being void and that can result in the charity and the trustees potentially being in a very difficult position as a result. A really common um, example of this would be that in many governing documents there's a requirement for a specific number of charity trustees to be present at a meeting to make a legitimate decision, often called a quorum. Okay? If you don't have that minimum number in the room, you try and make a decision, that decision may not be a legitimate one. Okay? Charity trustees also need to be able to explain the decisions that they've, ma <laughs> they've made and the reasons for those decisions. So it's really good practice, I would say, to keep a record of what is discussed the decisions that you reach, and again, the reasons for that. If there's a need, perhaps, to come back at a later period in time and revisit a decision, or perhaps if the decision is challenged in some way, um, maybe by an unhappy third party, that will help the charity trustees to really show that they have considered all the relevant factors that they should have. 
Rounding off then the look at the general duties of trustees, um, I'm going to just cover conflicts of interest just briefly. Now within the trustee duties which are set out in charity law, there's a very specific type of conflict of interest that's referred to. We often call it the appointment conflict. And it arises between a person or an organisation who appointed a charity trustee and the interests of the charity. So what we have is a very specific duty set out in law to manage that conflict of interest appropriately. Just a word of warning, however. Don't fall into the trap of thinking that that's the only type of conflict of interest that charity trustees have to deal with, OK? That one is pulled, pulled out into a separate duty in law. And it does, and it, of course, it, it would be dealt with in complying with the, the duty for trustees to always act in the interests of the charity, OK? But uh, there's a more specific requirement that you have to really, trustees have to manage every potential and actual conflict of interest that, that comes along for their organisation because of that overarching duty to act in the interest of the charity at all times. Okay? So it's really key to remember that you have to put the interest of the charity, not yours as a trustee, not your family's, not your friends, not your business interests. It's got to be the interest of the charity front and foremost. There's some very practical help um, that we've got in our guidance and good practice document for charity trustees, a copy of which you all have on your, your table. It's the, the kind of A4 booklet that's kind of spiral bound. Reflecting on my own experience since I joined Oscar 11 years ago, one of the most common areas I have seen charity trustees really struggle with is conflict of interest. And the reason it comes up time and time again is because it can occur in every different shape and size of charity that we have. Okay? In the guidance booklet that I'm talking about, you'll see there's some very practical tips for helping charity trustees deal with conflict of interest. And essentially, there are four key steps that you'll see in the guidance. The first is identify. Make sure that as charity trustees, you are able to really easily pick up where there is a conflict or a potential conflict, okay, so that you can deal with the situation appropriately. Second, manage. Have a proper procedure that's clear how the conflict is going to be handled and make sure that everyone that needs to understand this does so. <coughs> Third, record. Keep a record of what actually happens. Even when you're having a trustee meeting, for instance, note down when <coughs> declarations of interest are actually declared at the start of the meeting um, and, what the, and consider what the implications for those declarations might be. And then learn. Reflect and make improvements or changes where necessary to the approach that you're taking as a charity. So my top tips would really be to make sure you have a conflict of interest policy that's easy to understand and make sure that every charity trustee understands it fully. It's really similar to the point that Jude made when she was talking about a safeguarding policy earlier. It's no good having a policy that's too complex or too long for people to get to grips with. Simple and focused, I would say, does it every time. Make sure that the policy is applied properly, have proper procedures to deal with conflicts when they arise, and manage them appropriately. It can be really, really dangerous for trustees to ignore conflicts of interest. And as tricky as it can sometimes be to actually manage them, it is always the safest option, I would suggest. Now, earlier on, I mentioned that as well as the general duties um, of charity trustees, there are also some very specific ones which are set out in law. Um, and I'm going to just cover those in brief. The first relates to charity trustee details, sorry, char charity details on the Scottish Charity Register. And trustees have to keep us updated with relevant information. In law, there are certain details about every charity that have to appear on the register. So they include the name of the charity, its principal office and the purposes of the charity. Trustees have to ensure that OSCA is notified of any changes to these where they occur and it's our expectation <laughs> that the notification comes to us on a timely basis. So I would suggest that means within a few weeks of the change having actually happened at the most. Of course, the charities would need to seek permission from us before they change the purposes in any case. So it's not a simple fact that they could change the purpose and just tell us. They <coughs> need to obviously seek prior consent to take that course of action. Many of you will also know that there's an option for charities to have a link um, to their website on their entry on the Scottish Charity Register, and plus a, a more specific link to where the charity publishes its annual report and accounts on its website, if indeed it does so. We would really like to encourage as many charities as possible to take advantage of that opportunity, because it contributes to much greater transparency within the sector. 
It also um, allows interested stakeholders to find out much more information about your charity. Publishing your own report and accounts also allows that information to be placed into an appropriate context so that the charity can provide a simple explanation of what it's doing, um, including its purposes and its plans for the future, alongside its annual report and accounts. And then it means that all the information can be read from a slightly more informed perspective. And potentially that makes the information a lot more helpful for the reader. The next one's about reporting to Oscar, making changes to your charity. This is really about situations where the law requires trustees to seek consent from Oscar before they take certain actions. I mentioned earlier, for instance, that you can't change your charity's purposes of your own volition. You have to seek consent from us before you take that course of action. We have guidance on our website that explains how the consent regime works, what it applies to, and I would very much encourage you to have a look at that if you're in that type of situation. Key thing here to remember is that if you want to take an action like changing your name or changing your purposes, you can't just gaily go ahead and do that. You have to um, come to us and seek consent, no matter how fantastic you think your new name might be or your new purposes might be, you need to come and ask us first. The third one's about financial records and reporting, the bit that everyone, I would say, traditionally gets kind of frightened of. Now, all charities are required to keep good accounting records and to prepare an annual report and accounts that is externally scrutinised by either an auditor or an independent examiner. The annual report and accounts are then submitted to us along with the charity's annual return, which is now completed online, of course. Uh, you, many of you all, all know the, the for ins and outs of an Oscar online system. Now, I'm just going to pause a moment here and I'm going to indulge the accountant in me if you'll allow me to do so. Because this is an area that traditionally so many charity trustees seem to be immensely anxious about. Um, and which, so often I would say, the responsibility just gets passed to one trustee. If I had a pound for every time I have heard a phrase like, I don't understand accounts, or that's the treasurer's job, then I could probably retire now and I only had my 41st birthday this year. Okay? The reality is, is that all charity trustees need to have a reasonable level of understanding of the charity's finances so that when they're making decisions that involve commitment of financial resources, they're made from an informed position and with an understanding of the implications for their charity. It's simply not good enough, I would suggest, to say that you don't understand how much money the charity has because surely you wouldn't say that about your own finances. Next, we've got fundraising. <coughs> now, this is an area um, that's seen an awful lot of publicity and some changes in regulation um, over the last couple of years, particularly right across the UK. Key points that I just want to highlight here are that charity trustees have to take all steps to ensure that funds that are raised for them are properly accounted for. I would also say that if those funds are collected for a very specific purpose, then remember they can only be used for that purpose. We've now got a dedicated section on our website about fundraising. So if you're looking for further information on that, then have a wee look. Okay, you'll find it from the, the drop-down men menu um, along the, the title bar. Lastly, providing information to the public. There's a couple of requirements just to remember on this one. The first is being clear on all of your charity's materials that you are a charity and having your name and your Scottish charity number displayed very clearly. Now that applies to stationery, to your website, to your email, all that kind of stuff. David alluded to that earlier. Secondly, there's provision in charity law for any person to request from a charity a copy of their governing document and their latest annual report and accounts. So if you receive a request for that information, you have to comply with it, okay? Providing that request is a reasonable one. You are potentially allowed to charge the person requesting the information for any costs that you incur of providing it, so that could include postage or photocopying, for instance. But as I mentioned earlier, we really do encourage all charities to take advantage and publish their own annual report and accounts anyway, and that would potentially get over, over that need to supply it on request. So rounding off this, this duty section, it's maybe just time to, I think, reflect on what all of this means together. <coughs> So as the leaders of a charity, trustees are responsible for what happens and how things happen. It's therefore very important for trustees to understand and comply with their legal duties and the requirements of the charity's governing document. 
Being a charity trustee can be an immensely rewarding experience. Those of you in the room that occupy that role already, I'm sure you'll be aware of that. You are contributing to a great cause, and it's a cause that you will be enthusiastic and committed to, and that can give you an awful lot of satisfaction. But, as we said earlier, there will be difficult times. But with your fellow trustees, you can get through those tricky bits, and you can work together for the very purpose that brought you together in the first place. So when times are tough, rem remember that and remind each other of that as well, I would suggest. And lastly, I would say that it's really easy for charity trustees to sometimes lose sight of the importance of good governance in their organisation. Because understandably so, um, they're, they're so focused on actually what the charity is doing in terms of its activities um, and, its, and its kind of purposes and its plans for the future. But having robust governance is very important in terms of strong decision making, comprehensive policies and procedures, and really good, strong oversight and monitoring. And all of that, working well and working collectively, helps to protect the charity's reputation. And ultimately, I would suggest it makes the job of being a charity trustee much easier. So, just a little bit of summing up then. As we've seen here, the role of the charity trustee means having a lot of power, but that in turn obviously involves an awful lot of responsibility as well. I've got five key sort of takeaway pointers for you um, to kind of remember. The first is about using your passion and your enthusiasm for the charity and the board and the board's benefit. Don't lose that. Use it to your advantage as a group of charity trustees because you will need it. Secondly, remember your legal duties as charity trustees. Act in the interest of the charity with care and diligence, in line with the purposes and manage conflicts of third is that challenges can be overcome, but do not shy away from them. Tackle them head on, no matter how scary that may, that may seem. Don't expect them to be solved just by other people. Trustees are the people that have ultimate responsibility, so try to work through the tough times. And fourthly, seek help from other people when you really need it. Don't be nervous about getting help from another organisation because that can be immensely valuable and it can also save you an awful lot of time if you're struggling particularly with something internally. And lastly, I would say that good governance of your charity is absolutely critical. Do not lose sight of it. I can't overemphasise that enough. It's so important to keep on thinking about how the organisation is functioning as well as what it's doing and what it is actually delivering. Now that fourth point there about not being alone is a really important one to remember, not ne just now but in the future too. If you encounter <coughs> a bump in the road, there are an awful lot of organisations out there who can help you as a charity and who can help you as charity trustees if you need assistance. David mentioned earlier the fact that in every local authority area in Scotland there is what we call a third sector interface organisation. Edinburgh is rec re um, represented here today by Ed Edinburgh Voluntary Organisations Council and indeed SCVO are here as well, obviously, and they cover all of Scotland. There are a lot of organisations out there who can help and support you. Others were featured here with their, their stands today, and you've maybe picked up some information during the coffee break from some of them. And also, just a little reminder again, that we've got some really good guidance material on our website that, ch as charities, you may find useful. In the main, it's bite-sized chunks. It's focused and it's to the point. We tried really hard not to use language that you need three degrees to actually be able to try and understand. In particular, that guidance and good practice for charity trustees document that everyone's got a copy of is really great in explaining the legal duties in a bit more detail. And it's got an awful lot of good practice tips in there as well for getting your governance spot on. The smaller booklet that David highlighted as well earlier on, the Being a Charity in Scotland one, some of you might have picked that up from the stand um, break, provides a really good reference point to understand the key requirements of being a charity in terms of meeting the charity test and a good reminder of trustee duties. My particular favourite bit of that is the top ten tips. Kind of, you'll find that just inside the back cover. So, as a final reminder, I would say trustees have to act as a team. They should act collectively and supportively. The job can be hard enough without making it harder. Instead, I would suggest that you harness all that is positive about why you chose to become involved and the fact that you're all committed to that same cause and you should use that to best effect. <coughs> Pat, would you like to round up for us? Sure. Firstly, huge thanks to Laura for that session and to you for helping. <coughs>
So just a few final words. I suppose for me as an eternal optimist, I could pick up that point about the stone rolling up to the hill. Um, I'd love to hear about the opportunities. There's a huge amount of positive work being done and it's the bit that we don't hear about. Um, there was a report a year or so ago that likened third sector leadership to juggling while cycling on a unicycle. Um, and it's all those myriad of things that you try to keep spinning and it tends to be the one ball that's dropped that people remembered, not the half a dozen that you still have in the air while you're still cycling on the unicycle. So there is something about acknowledging the great work that's been done and trying to shout about and highlight a lot of the good practice as well. So I'm really keen that we see that happening. I also always like to quite finish with a quote. So before I came down today, I was having a wee look at what quote might be appropriate. And I found one that was from someone who I don't know. He's a psychiatrist, a chap called Anthony Daniels. Um, and after hearing the conversations, I think it's actually very apt. What he says is wisdom and good governance require more than the consistent application of abstract principles. I'll say that again. Wisdom and good governance require more than the consistent application of abstract principles. And I think that quite neatly ties up what's been talked about this afternoon. You can have all the best paperwork policies in place, but it's how you act together as a board, how you build trust, respect, have the right behaviours, and make sure the charity is doing what it needs to be doing, and to get the balance between the exec and the non-exec and the aim of the charity and the impact it hopes to make. So I think that's really come out this afternoon over the discussions. So that only really leaves me to say thank you to everybody for this afternoon. Thank you to all of you for coming along this afternoon. We very much realise that we're often preaching this to the converted. Those of you that are here are the ones that really take good governance on board, which we really appreciate. Um, there is two more sessions to happen. I think it's Motherwell and Open. So if any of your board couldn't come and are in the area, I'm sure there'll be information on the website. Um, and thank you to all of the staff that have both input and been here today from Oscar. And equally, thank you to those that have manned stands and the support organisations that are here. And finally, to um, the Royal Scott Club for the fabulous cake and coffee and for looking after <laughs> us so well this afternoon. So thanks everyone for a really uh, useful afternoon. Thank you.